Sup, chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, I've got some breaking news on the oral minoxidil front that's actually pretty damn exciting. Longtime viewers of this channel know that I have pretty negative views about oral minoxidil to treat hair loss. Oral minoxidil has been around for decades now, but it only became mainstream about four years ago, largely because of the fluff piece by the New York Times that overhyped the bleeding crap out of it. Most hair tubers on YouTube are fine promoting oral minoxidil, but I haven't been. In fact, many of my followers seem to think that I am irrationally prejudiced against oral minoxidil, but that's not the case at all. You see, let me briefly explain my position, Chooms. Minoxidil was first developed in the 1970s to treat high blood pressure. However, it was soon realized that oral minoxidil had a very unusual side effect, hypertrichosis, which means hair growth all over the body and the scalp. Now, the dose of minoxidil used to treat high blood pressure ranges from 10 milligrams to 40 milligrams per day, though in some cases the dose can be as high as 100 milligrams per day. Unfortunately, soon after minoxidil was released, it was discovered that it had negative effects on cardiovascular health. For example, this study found that minoxidil caused changes in the electrocardiogram in 90% of people who are taking it. Worse than that though, in about 5% of patients, pericardial effusion occurred, meaning the buildup of fluid around the heart. This is a potentially life-threatening problem, because if fluid builds up around the heart, it can inhibit the pumping function of the heart, which is a condition called cardiac tamponade. So, because of these major problems with oral minoxidil, it was hypothesized that developing a topical solution Solution would be a good way to get the hair growth benefits of minoxidil while avoiding the very severe cardiovascular dangers of oral minoxidil. This hypothesis was ultimately proven correct, and topical minoxidil became the very first FDA-approved treatment for hair loss. It was released in 1988 as the product called Rogaine, which back then was a prescription-only product. Rogaine Extra Strength works for four out of five men. What do you mean, works? Since that glorious day for us hair loss sufferers, topical minoxidil has had an exemplary safety record, which is why it was released as an over-the-counter medication in 1996, first as a 2% solution and then as a 5% solution. There have been no reports of pericardial fusion due to topical minoxidil use in the medical literature. That's probably because the systemic absorption of topical minoxidil is very slow. That means the blood levels remain low and there are no sudden spikes in the blood levels that might trigger cardiac problems as we see that commonly happens with oral minoxidil. You can see that in this graph where topical minoxidil was applied multiple times per day. The minoxidil blood levels remain less than 2 nanograms per milliliter. On the other hand, after a dose of oral minoxidil, the blood level rapidly peaks and then rapidly falls. This is true even when giving low doses of oral minoxidil as you can see here. Also, contrary to popular belief, oral minoxidil is not more efficacious than topical minoxidil. That is unless of course you're giving a very high dosage to the subject, similar to what someone would use if they were using this drug to treat high blood pressure pressure, for instance. Doses that are 5 milligrams per day or lower, though, are not more effective than topical minoxidil, and I made a video where I explained the science behind all that, which I'll link below. So because of oral minoxidil's limitations in both its efficacy and safety, most people seem to be content with the low toxicity, low cost, and high efficacy of topical minoxidil. That was at least until 2018 when Dr. Rodney Sinclair published an article where he used a combination of 0.25 milligrams per day of oral minoxidil alongside with spironolactone to treat women with androgenic alopecia. Notice that this is actually a very low dose of oral minoxidil, and this brings us to a very common problem with the term low dose oral minoxidil. It's the fact that pretty much everyone has a different interpretation of what actually constitutes a low dose of oral minoxidil. Lots of people are using doses of oral minoxidil that are 20 times higher than what Dr. Sinclair used in his experiment, but are still calling it low dose oral minoxidil. They're using doses approaching the doses used to treat hypertension, like 5 milligrams once or even twice per day, and calling that low dose oral minoxidil when it actually isn't. The use of this so-called low-dose oral minoxidil really took off after the New York Times published this article in 2022. This increase in the usage of oral minoxidil that was triggered by the New York Times article was actually documented in a scientific paper. For a while, it was assumed that low-dose oral minoxidil was safe because it was a low dose. However, there have now been multiple case reports of low-dose oral minoxidil causing the same pericardial effusions that high-dose oral minoxidil causes. So, it turns out that oral minoxidil Minoxidil's negative side effects are idiosyncratic, meaning they're not very dose dependent. And I went over those cases in several videos, so I'll just go ahead and link my entire oral minoxidil playlist below, and I highly encourage you all to watch it. 
So I hope this better explains why, up until now at least, I have not been comfortable recommending oral minoxidil on my channel. The risk of serious side effects could still be very low, but we're not talking about side effects that are just merely inconvenient nuisances, like low libido and erectile dysfunction. No, we're talking about very serious things, like pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. Those are the kind of side effects that can kill you. And even if just one of my viewers were to die as a consequence of the advice I give on my channel, I would never be able to forgive myself. So even if you disagree with my stance on oral minoxidil, I hope people can at least respect my prudence on the subject, at least until we get better data that is. However, it looks like there may be a new innovation in oral minoxidil that could mitigate the drug's dangers while also enhancing the drug's efficacy. There is a new preparation of oral minoxidil that is being investigated as we speak known as extended release oral minoxidil. I think it is very promising because it looks like it may avoid the problems of the usual preparations of oral minoxidil and it might even be more effective than either oral minoxidil or even topical minoxidil. In fact, just last month, the results of a phase 2 trial of this new oral minoxidil preparation was presented in Paris, France at a medical meeting called the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology. The new drug preparation is codenamed VDPHL01 and it is a form of extended release oral minoxidil. The doctor who presented the paper, Dr. Jerry Shapiro from the New York University School of Medicine, states that the main advantage of this form of minoxidil is that it maintains steady blood levels without peaks and troughs. He says, Quote, we think that the extended release formulation offers an opportunity to maintain drug levels above those needed for therapeutic effect, but below those associated cardiac adverse events, unquote. So clearly, there is a segment of the medical community that agrees that oral minoxidil is not safe. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any attempts to develop a safer version of oral minoxidil. Dr. Jerry Shapiro feels the same way I do about the drug, and that's that the side effects that happen with oral minoxidil happen because of the peaks in blood levels that occur after each each and every dose. It's interesting that he himself had to deal with a significant cardiac adverse event in his own private practice because of oral minoxidil use, and that's presumably because of some kind of cardiac effusion that his patient must have experienced. So it's no surprise to me that doctors are looking for innovations to get around oral minoxidil's severe cardiovascular dangers. So besides avoiding the peaks in blood levels from immediate release oral minoxidil, Dr. Shapiro hypothesized that the more steady minoxidil blood levels you get from the extended release form of minoxidil allows for more sulfation of the drug, which is necessary to convert the drug from its inactive form into its active form, which is called minoxidil sulfate. So here are the details of the study. There were three study groups. One group of 20 subjects received extended release minoxidil at a dose of 8.5 milligrams twice per day. The second group of 33 subjects received immediate release minoxidil at a dose of 5 milligrams per day. The last group of 34 subjects got 5% topical minoxidil twice per day. The results were assessed after just four months of treatment in the extended release minoxidil group, but they waited six months to assess the results in the other groups. I guess the investigators wanted to be able to say that the extended release minoxidil worked faster but I'm not sure you can say that unless you looked at all the groups at the same time. But anyways, the investigators were blinded to the treatment groups. At the end of the study, they looked at before and after photographs of both the frontal and vertex regions and graded them on a seven-point scale. The first method that was used to evaluate success was by looking at the before and after photos and trying to distinguish the before photos from the after photos. But based on this before and after photograph metric, the extended release form was able to pass this test over 90% of the time versus 70% of the time with immediate release oral minoxidil, and there was an even lower percentage with topical minoxidil. Looking at the improvement in hair loss scoring, the extended release minoxidil was definitely superior to both the immediate release oral minoxidil and to topical minoxidil too. So, the study concludes, quote, this extended release form of minoxidil demonstrates superior efficacy in a shorter duration. Within four months, you see 3.5 fold higher investigator global assessment scores compared with the other formulations, along with clinically meaningful improvement, unquote. Now, I'll be the first to admit here that this study isn't perfect. The study didn't look at actual hair counts using a phototrichogram, which is a much more objective assessment than using a point score for assessing efficacy. Also, there are far too few subjects that draw any real strong conclusions about its efficacy. Also, the dose of minoxidil in the extended release form was 17 milligrams per day, which was much higher than the immediate release form of oral minoxidil at just five milligrams per day. So the improved efficacy may just be dose related. But even if you do have to use a higher dose, that should be fine just so long as the drug is safe. After all, topical minoxidil has 50 milligrams of minoxidil per dose, and it's safe. 
So could it be that we finally have a safe and effective version of oral minoxidil in the form of VDP-HL01? Well, so far, the data does seem to suggest that it is safe. I imagine before it hits the market, we're likely going to have to see some more testing done on the levels of minoxidil in the blood after people take this form of minoxidil, just to assure that there isn't a peak in the blood level after taking the drug like we see with regular oral minoxidil. But if this early data is proven reliable, and this minoxidil preparation really does avoid the peaks in blood levels that immediate release oral minoxidil causes, then I'd be cautiously in favor of this as a potentially safe and effective form of oral minoxidil. That would be great news for everybody, but especially me, because my stance on oral minoxidil has caused a lot of drama on this channel. I've even lost subscribers because of it, so I would love to be able to say that there is a form of oral minoxidil that I am actually in favor of. So I am cheering for VDPHL01 success. You guys better not let me down. But for now, based on this early data, I am optimistic. So hopefully the company will move on to phase three studies soon and will have more data on the safety and efficacy of this new form of oral minoxidil. If it turns out to work as advertised, this will surpass 5% topical minoxidil as the ultimate hair growth stimulant on the market and it will become the only form of oral minoxidil I'll be able to get behind and enthusiastically support. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who take oral minoxidil and like the drug, and that's perfectly fine. I have nothing against people who choose to take oral minoxidil. But personally speaking, I think we can do a whole lot better than some abandoned last resort repurposed blood pressure medication that doesn't even work that well unless you use extremely high doses, which of course is very dangerous. I think VDP-HL01 has the potential to be the drug that lives up to the undeserved hype of low-dose oral minoxidil. So I'm hoping research moves along quickly on this one and we actually get it to the market because I'd love to put all this drama about oral minoxidil behind me forever. All right, chums. So I'll be back with some more preem content very soon. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.